Paul Washer's unique rise to prominence as a global voice for Christ was both sudden and unexpected. An unspoken cry from the heart of God was voiced in the sermon, shocking youth message, and the word delivered did not return void. Christendom was shocked. And I want you to know that when you take a look at American Christianity, it is based more upon a godless culture than it is upon the word of God. And so many people are deceived and so many youth are deceived and so many adults are deceived into believing that because they prayed a prayer one time in their life, they're going to heaven. And then when they look around at others who profess to know Christ and see those people also just as worldly as the world, and they compare themselves by themselves, nothing troubles their heart. They think, well, I'm the same as most in my youth group. I watch things I shouldn't watch on television and laugh about the very things that God hates. I wear clothing that is sensual. I talk like the world. I walk like the world. I love the music of the world. I love so much that's in the world. But bless God, I am a Christian. Why am I a Christian? I don't look any different than most of the other people in my church. Why am I a Christian? Because there was a time in my life when I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates and a love for the things that God loves. A growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, not to be like the world, and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. I didn't come here to get amens. I didn't come here to be applauded. I'm talking about you. Many of the things that you love to do, God hates. Did you know that? Pray for revival. You're going to have a youth meeting. You want God to move. But before you go there, you watch programs on television that God absolutely despises. And then you wonder why the Holy Spirit hasn't fallen on a place and why you have to create false fire and false excitement. Because God's not in it. God is a holy God. And the only way you and I could ever be reconciled to a holy God is through the death of God's own Son. When He hung on that tree. Most of what we believe to be true is dictated to us by our culture and not by the Bible. One of the greatest evidences that you have truly been born again is that God will not let you talk as your flesh might want to talk. God will not let you dress as the sensual world and the sensual church allows you to dress. God will not allow you to act like the world, smell like the world, speak like the world, listen to the things that the world listens to. God will make a difference in your life by their fruit. By their fruit, my dear friend. Look at your life. Look at the way you walk. Look at the way you talk. Look at the passions of your heart. Is Jesus in there somewhere? Or is He just some accessory that you add on to your life? Is He just something you do on Wednesday or Sunday? Is He something that you give a mental assent to? Is He an accessory or is He the very center of your life? And what is the fruit that you're bearing? Do you look like the world, act like the world? Do you have and experience the same joys that the world experiences? Can you love sin and relish it? Can you love rebellion and relish it? Then you know not God. If you can play around in sin, if you can love the world and love the things of the world, if you can always be involved in the world and doing things of the world, if your heroes are worldly people, if you want to look like them and act like them, if you practice the same things they practice, oh, my dear friend, listen to my voice. There's a good chance you know not God and you do not belong to Him. We talk so much about being radical Christians. Radical Christians are not people who jump at concerts. Radical Christians are not people who wear Christian t-shirts. 
Radical Christians are those who bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Radical Christians are those who reverence and honor their parents, even when they feel like their parents are wrong. Radical Christians are those who do not... Now listen to me, this is going to make you mad. Who do, and I'm talking to boys and girls, radical Christians are those who do not dress sensually in order to show off their bodies. If your clothing is a frame for your face, God is pleased with your clothing. If your clothing is a frame for your body, it's sensual and God hates what you're doing. Everybody wants to talk about a prophet, but no one wants to listen to one. I wish, do you know what a move of God would be in this place? If all of you came under conviction, if I myself came under conviction of the Holy Spirit, we fell down on our faces and wept because we watched the things that God hates. Because we wear the things that God hates. Because we act like the world, look like the world, smell like the world. Because we do the very things, and we know not that we do these things because we do not know the Word of God. It's only a matter of time until the silence of cowardice is broken by the outcry of true men of God who are valiant for the truth no matter the cost. True prophets are God's emergency men, and desperate times call for desperate measures. In this case, God found Paul Washer willing to speak the hard truth that others weren't willing to preach, and it happened to be at a youth conference. Paul Washer boldly decried American Christianity, warning the people about the broad road that our godless culture dictates and defines as morality. In one word, Paul Washer decried worldliness, specifically as it is manifested in how people live, how they act, walk, talk, look, and smell. At a heart level, Paul spoke of what makes people laugh while they watch television and what music they listen to or enjoy. In bodily presence, Paul spoke of how they look and or what they wear for clothing, how they walk, and even how they smell. He even gave guidelines to the people to help them discern how to dress modestly in a culture that is consumed with lust and sensuality. Religious hypocrites and sinners don't ever want to hear specifics when it comes to their involvement with the world and the things that God hates. They would prefer the broad strokes of most modern-day preachers who refuse to be dogmatically black and white about morality, making people feel secure and happy in the gray. To be clear, Paul was contrasting a life of holiness with a desire to be like Britney Spears or other worldly people that are the heroes of American culture. After a sleepless night of prayer, it's no wonder that God owned the message and published it worldwide. Nevertheless, discerning listeners are made to wonder what has become of Paul Washer these past two decades. The man who openly condemned the personification of worldliness embodied in Britney Spears without apology was later bewitched to lay hands upon Lecrae and Trip Lee, among others. And this was before Lecrae stormed the echelons of the music and entertainment business of America by crossing over to mainstream music, hitting number one on the Billboard 200 with his 2014 album, Anomaly. I am not given to flattery. I believe that flattery is a sin, a dark sin that does no help to the hearer. But I have met with men in the last two days that were men who did not so much have a passion for a style of music as they had a passion for God and the truth of God. And everything without that, absolutely everything that would be done here would be vanity and foolish and useless. But the fact of the matter is, some of the words that I heard spoken here in the songs were truth, the type of truth that this country needs, the type of truth this world needs, the type of truth that the church needs. I came here thinking that I would hear hip hop. I came here thinking that I would hear rappers. I heard preaching. I heard preaching. And I heard a respect for the truth and a desire to communicate it. The art form you're doing here, what is it known for? 
in the world. It is known for sin and immorality. It is known to be vile and to cause destruction. But yesterday and today, I saw the same thing happen to a music form that has happened to my life. God has taken it, cleaned it off, made it new, and filled it with life. But let me give you a warning that's very important. As a preacher, I know this. Whenever eloquence is more important than the words spoken, there is no power. And whenever a music medium becomes more important than the truth it seeks to communicate, it's useless. Now, I didn't see that here. I, I stayed up last night till almost three in the morning with a group of men. And I was absolutely amazed. I couldn't even sleep this morning because I was saying, Lord, what a privilege it was for me to be in the midst of a group of young men that you're raising up, that believe the ancient ways. Now, if Jonathan Edwards were to come back from the dead and see some of these guys, he would probably be afraid. <laughs> but they're saying the exact same truth, and they're speaking to a people that Spurgeon could not reach, and Edwards could not reach, Whitfield could not reach. I applaud what's being done here. I came here only to be a spectator, to see, God, are you in any of this? But in the hearts of the men and the words of the music, I am greatly, greatly encouraged. I'll only warn you, it is so hard to be a true preacher of the gospel. And it is so hard to live out the truth that we proclaim to others. But that is the task for every one of you who rap, for every one of you involved in this. You have a special stewardship from God. You must be holy. Paul hasn't publicly repented of his actions before the millions of souls who look for his approval as a means of personal gratification, nor has he delivered any rebukes to Lecrae, Tripoli, and company as they led the neo-Calvinists of today into worldliness in a mighty exodus from conservative Christianity. Even as Lecrae and the 116 click shamelessly act, walk, talk, look, and smell like the world, in all the ways identified and boldly decried in the shocking youth message, Paul remains silent before the remnant. Can you believe it? Even in the face of increasingly unspeakable abominations, like when Lecrae coarsely jested with a homosexual on the red carpet when Tyler Oakley asked him about the secret of his success as a musician, and he laughingly pointed to the fact that he shaves his chest. The secret formula, is there anything that you know works every single time or is it kind of like hope for the best? Yeah, you have to shave your chest. I don't have to do that, I am completely ready. You should be an incredible musician. That's the secret, if you didn't know, if you shave your chest, you will write hits. I am like a 12 year old boy, I am just prepared. You're a huge, you're a phenomenal musician, you might not even know that. And I'm a great collaborator, you can lift me if you need to work out in the studio. I think we need to do something together. Man, at least you can be my trainer or something. God bless. <laughs> This wasn't a mere slip of the tongue, either. Lecrae had already become wildly popular among the heathen for his treachery on all sides. Lecrae has made a career out of apostasy, passionately listening to, enjoying, and admiring talented hip-hop music that glorifies sin while erroneously justifying it in the name of art, emulating the same as he artistically glorifies himself in a professed self-discovery before the world. Of course, Lecrae has absolutely no problem laughing, dancing, and partying with sinners as long as he isn't drunk or high, nor does he have a problem producing music with and or praising the loudest mouthpieces of Satan in the entertainment business, dressing outrageously immodest in gangster apparel and or designer clothes as the occasion requires. Lecrae regularly celebrates covetousness, lust, sensuality, and the pride of life. Albeit, 
Lecrae disguises these worldly practices by claiming to be on a journey of self-discovery with his peers in a pursuit of creativity, style, and art, because he doesn't want to appear to be a sellout in the eyes of devout Christians. Earthly fortune and fame comes with a price. No wonder the world is happy to watch Lecrae on television as he is broadcasted as a star by the mainstream entertainment business of godless American culture. Having become a bona fide celebrity and following in the footsteps of those who went before him on the red carpet, Lecrae now dreams of the day that he could rid himself of the Christian label that he's been branded with. Ever wonder why Paul Washer doesn't openly rebuke this madness? Amazingly, instead of openly disassociating himself from Lecrae and company, Paul publicly boasts in the personal friendships he has with these men. Yeah, um, what are your views on, like, Christian rap and Christian rock? Um, Lecrae and Tripoli are both friends of mine. Um, now you, re you really think I'm cool, don't you? But I consider it an honor for them to be my friends, not because they're rappers, but because they really seek to be men of God. And they are. They walk in integrity. But if they were here right now, they would tell you what they do is extremely dangerous. What happened to Paul Washer? How can he publicly honor these men as true men of God who walk in integrity without batting an eye? Will nobody of reputation in Calvinism today say anything about it? Can these men still blush? Silence in such times as these can only mean that worldliness like a disease has touched the remnant leaders, even because the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Paul Washer is clearly starstruck by Lecrae and Tripoli. The cult personality of false Christianity is strong, and now even Paul Washer is rapping. Meanwhile, Paul's good friend and fellow celebrity preacher, Vodi Bakum, is admittedly obsessed with martial arts and daydreams about returning to the mats for violence. Not even a move to Africa for missions could quench his lust for martial arts, so he started a dojo in Zambia. I'm sure Paul Washer has no problem with it. He celebrates the fact that Ian and Evan and even Rohan have been training in martial arts for years, and now the oldest has gotten into kickboxing. As Paul and Rosario enjoy making violent jokes before hundreds of thousands of onlookers in cyberspace, while quoting iconic movies like Bloodsport, one can only imagine how much of the godless culture of America has infected the souls of the Washer family. This is coming from a man who famously preached so strongly against watching programs on television that God absolutely despises. Nevertheless, the Washer family is clearly entertained by the Lord of the Rings. Not only does Rosario Washer boast about her favorite scene in the movie, when her kids came to learn how to ride horses, she couldn't help but celebrate the achievement by calling them all the riders of Rohan. Considering the fact that the Lord of the Rings is a cinematic tutorial of witchcraft that has led people by droves into practicing magic worldwide, this is truly disturbing. Then later on, Rosario is inspired to dress up Rohan like Rey from Star Wars, while enthusiastically publishing hashtags like Star Wars The Force Awakens and Star Wars Geek as she playfully calls her kids by the nickname Kamikaze. Rosario, also called Chado, is so absorbed with the world that her slogan for her recently removed photography website read, Photography is a love affair with life. All this and more is countenanced by Paul Washer, the same man who valiantly challenged people's conversion to Christ based upon if their heroes are worldly people, if they want to look like them and act like them. Given the hypocrisy, 
This makes me wonder what inspired Paul and Rosario to name their two baby girls Rowan and Bronwyn. Could it be that they named their kids after characters from the Lord of the Rings? God knows. Considering the circumstances, one can only wonder the topic of laughter as the friends and family members of Paul Washer gather together for a good time. The Church Universal would be shocked to hear Paul being made to laugh about the very things that God hates. Nevertheless, his conscience has become seared, so now he jokes about how his wife lied to him with Todd Friel, an obnoxious and insober radio personality who was gifted at bringing relatively serious men into a state of carnality and lightness. I'm sure Todd feels guilty about his noisome insobriety of character, so he has capitalized on the moment to officially broadcast Paul Washer's sense of humor to the whole world. How many unconverted or backslidden souls of this generation are justifying the practice of serious sin simply because Paul Washer does it? I know for certain that Les Lanfear is doing it. You know, the man who got Paul Washer to rap? He somehow achieved this while interviewing him for a recently released movie, Calvinist, seeing he was entrusted with the apostolic role of capturing the essence of what it means to be Calvinist to the up-and-coming generation of today. As a beer enthusiast who has the audacity to name his podcast on theology, Reformed Pubcast, you can imagine who else might be in the fame documentary he put together. Men like Joe Thorne and Jeff Durbin. As a lead pastor, Joe unashamedly has a love for all things dark. And by this he means things like horror movies, death metal, and dark fiction. With such passions, you can imagine what Thorne has in mind when he named his dog Lucifer. Jeff Durbin, however, needs no introduction. Jeff has become a controversial figure among Calvinists today because of his lascivious lifestyle. Judging by how he acts, looks, walks, talks, and smells, he is often wrongly accused of being a drunkard. However, this is something he proudly denies, only because he hasn't tasted a beer for years out of personal preference. Nevertheless, he might as well be drunk. Jeff certainly isn't afraid to watch the things that God hates, wear the things that God hates, act like the world, look like the world, and smell like the world, to quote Paul Washer. In fact, this is the subplot entertainment of the late night talk show that Durbin hosts called Next Week with Jeff Durbin where he is the star comedian. As a plague upon the church and a blasphemous stench in heathen society, Durbin's filthy antics often include vulgarity, cursing, insobriety, insincerity, and mockery. In one such episode, this was the opening statement. Oh, here we go, we're gonna get in trouble. Here and next week, uh, we like to engage with cultural issues from a biblical, honest, and logical standpoint. In other words, the way Americans used to debate before the existence of CNN. <laughs> now sure, this gets us in trouble with atheists, social justice warriors, and the <laughs> hat-wearing socialist Marxist Bernie Sanders hype men. <laughs> but what else would they do if they didn't have us? I mean, just how many episodes of Bill Maher can someone really watch, right guys? I say all of that because of the subject I'm gonna talk about today, marijuana. That's right, marijuana. See, Christians don't know whether they should cheer for that or not. <laughs> Quiet. Now I know as soon as I said that, some of you guys are quickly writing an argument in the comments section. And some of you are writing a comment in favor of the subject, but you're writing it real slow. <laughs> now, what made us want to talk about marijuana? Maybe it's because we're apparently gluttons for punishment. Maybe it's because we haven't seen too many Christians address the subject, but it's also because we are constantly asked the question, well, that and Chad the local bro won't stop bothering us about it. <laughs> hey, hey Jeff, is that, a, is that a pipe on your desk right there? Can I hit that? <laughs> is that, yeah, yeah, it's a pipe. Can, can I hit that, man? Puff, puff, pass, bro. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. Now, 
Uh, Chad, I hope you're happy because we're, gonna, we're not going to ignore this subject any longer. We're going to talk about marijuana, otherwise known as the <laughs> lettuce, <laughs> cr <laughs> d doobie, <laughs> ear <laughs> fat, <laughs> got <laughs> grass, <laughs> er <laughs> Jeff <laughs> airplane, <laughs> crypt <laughs> crypt <laughs> magic dr <laughs> Mary <laughs> <and> sticky <laughs> <laughs> corn <laughs> derbs, and my favorite Jeff Sessions Mac <laughs> hobby horse. <laughs> In another video from Apologia, Jeff Durbin happily leads Douglas Wilson and Toby Sumter in an exciting conversation about R-rated sensual vulgarities that are ashamed to even speak of. While making the occasion attractive by titling the video, Three Pastors and a Beer. Can you believe it? Paul Washer has clearly drifted away from biblical Christianity into worldliness not in filmmaking or conference associations merely, but at home with his family, which is a true test of godliness. Also at the pulpit, in the ministry of the Word, which should be the most sacred and guarded ministry of the ecclesiastical body of the church. Lo and behold, Jeff Durbin of all people has disgraced Paul Washer's renowned pulpit at Christ Church Radford. Keep in mind that this church is the ecclesiastical face of Hard Cry Missionary Society, and apparently Paul Washer and the Presbytery there considers Jeff Durbin to be a qualified elder in the faith of Jesus Christ. It's hard to exaggerate the implications of the poor discernment put on display here. There must be something terribly wrong with Hard Cry and Christ Church Radford. Indeed, before the Lord, there are many things wrong. And I'm sure witnesses would rise up and speak about it, if only Heartcry didn't silence and erase the names and ministries of those who have voiced any constructive criticism. The carnal tactics of merciless brutality employed by these men and former staff members of Heartcry is truly shocking. The cover-up and secrecy which has been widely successful to date makes it appear as if nothing at all has been amiss these past decades, especially among celebrity preachers. Sometimes the only evidence of catastrophe and scandal is the shuffling of the staff on a web page, because with a click of a button, the names, faces, and titles of precious souls are deleted. Then, upon looking at old newsletters, articles, magazine editions, or sermons, you find no trace of the ministries of these people, even though they invested years into hard cry. Speaking of such, you may have noticed something lately. Kevin Height, a close friend and trusted confidant of Paul Washer, was erased from heart cry. In October of 2020, he was simply deleted. Why? It's another cover-up for calamitous moral failures in the ranks, such that the members of Christ Church Radford and the associates of heart cry worldwide are still reeling with shock from the news. On October 8th, Kevin Height was arrested, and upon being interviewed by the police, he reportedly admitted to pedophilia and sexual misconduct with a girl for years, starting when she was 13 years old. Kevin is widely known to be one of the primary leaders of Hard Cry, and not a mere office administrator who deals with paperwork like a secretary. Deceitfully, in a secretive message that Hard Cry sent to notify their donors, Paul Washer changed Kevin Hyde's title from the Director of Operations to an Office Administrator, making it appear as if he was of little consequence to the Missionary Society in decisive pastoral ministry. On the contrary, Paul Washer called Kevin Hyde one of the pillars of heart cry, describing him to be the kind of guy you want in your foxhole during an all-out war. Sadly, former heart cry missionaries would attest to the same but not in a positive light. People would be shocked to hear about the true estate of the missionaries and church plants in Peru and the various fallouts that have happened throughout the decades. I know several former heart cry missionaries who have come out and testified of these things, and I'm sure there are more to come. Those who have been with Paul Washer in Peru in the early days can testify to the compromises that he has allowed in his life and ministry that has eventually led to this demise. Even outsiders can observe his growing affiliation with celebrity preachers. 
especially those of nobility in the cessationist sector of Calvinism in America. I'm sure this bad company has been damaging to his soul over time. Sadly, not all messengers prove faithful to the divine message that they were once empowered by God to deliver. Such can be said of Paul Washer and the shocking youth message. A man of God to Bethel came, decried the altar in Jehovah's name, but soon transgressed the divine order and never made it beyond the border. Wisely at first he determined to flee, but then entertained an older prophet's plea and fellowshiped a while in a forbidden land only to die at last for trespassing God's plan.